talk about projects. So humanitarian engineering projects, of course. Um, I'm going to do basically two things. We're going to talk about projects um, at OSU, and I want to emphasize them as models of how to approach humanitarianism, and in particular, humanitarian engineering. Then we're going to talk about projects, um, sort of best practices and principles of projects. When you go do a project somewhere, whether it's you know locally in uh, Columbus or whether it's um, you know in Colombia. Okay. Um, so we're going to start with the Humanitarian Engineering Center, which was established last June here at Ohio State College of Engineering. Um, this is the, the single slide that sort of explains the whole thing. Um, so uh, ignoring the flags for a minute, um, if you look at this center part, we've got uh, the traditional three areas of what happens in a university are research, education, service. Of course, research is education too, but usually they're separated. Um, under research, you might have undergraduate research, okay? um, but you also have you know, master's theses and and PhD dissertations and so forth. This is going on in, in the Humanitarian Engineering Center. Uh, this last uh, week I finished up an undergraduate honors thesis working on a local project here in Columbus. Um, last year I finished up a master's student who did a logistics study for a local food pantry. Um, I have three PhD students working um, on projects uh, and there's nine faculty in the College of Engineering doing humanitarian engineering research. Um, at the master's or PhD level, okay? Um, now, in the education area, what's going on is there's a course, this course, but there's also um, uh, Dr. Bixler's new course, Appropriate Technology for uh, Developing Countries, that I sent you the information on. Uh, there's a humanitarian engineering minor. Keep in mind, that's, it's, it's actually simple to remember. This course is a core course. Six credits, human welfare. Those can double count as your GEs, your general education courses, okay? Then you have six credits project work, either locally in Columbus or in another country, okay? Connected with that, so you these courses for going to other countries, um, there is typically a course for preparation before you go, okay? And usually what you're doing is designing technologies, um, the needs were identified probably on a previous trip, uh, you're designing various technologies, you're learning about culture, and then you go on your trip. Now there's variations on that, but that's roughly what's happening. So the six credits for project work, pretty easy to get, okay? Um, it might be the course, the prep course, plus three credits study abroad, or it might just be in Columbus, uh, prep work, you know, independent study, um, and undergraduate honors thesis, for instance. There's all kinds of ways to do it. It's a very flexible minor. Any um, major in the college can take the minor. Okay, full details of that are at the Humanitarian Engineering Center website. Under the service area, which I don't like the term, you know that, but that's the term that's used in the university. <laughs> when we talk about what happens in the university, we think of these three things, and then even in terms of like for me, for promotion and tenure for a professor, it's research, teaching, and service <coughs> is what you're, you're evaluated on, okay? It's for the basic things in the university. Service means something different here, though. We're talking about working with communities. Um, sometimes that's different than what's done with the university. And it's domestic or international, okay? So this is the structure. There's also the Humanitarian Engineering Scholars Program, which is a living, learning community. Uh, it's uh, freshmen, sophomores, generally, but there's like residual hang-ons too, but uh, first year people um, live together in a dorm uh, and there's several humanitarian engineering scholar people in this class, okay? So that program is part of the honors and scholars program. Uh, then there's engineering um, student organizations, um, service organizations. Those organizations, there's seven of them. Let me just name a few of the bigger ones. Um, they're in the oldest ones. Let me start kind of that order. Um, engineers for Community Service. Um, was started formation in fall 2003, became a student order in fall, uh, spring 2004, did the first um, trip to Montagne de Luz in spring 2005, and worked with it years afterwards, and also with Choteca, um, and lately they've been involved in the Colombia um, trip. They are non-disciplinary in the sense that 
they welcome all disciplines. There's not a concentration. People from all disciplines show up. That's why, the, I mean, they were formed with that intent in mind. Um, initially, uh, EWB at USA was formed at that point in time. We considered joining them as a chapter. And we, we rejected that because they were mostly doing civil engineering work in the end, okay? And uh, later, EWB formed at Ohio State about five years later or so in Department of Civil Engineering. Uh, Josh Savandron is currently the advisor for the EWB group, which is a sizable group. I talked to him earlier this semester. Um, they, so they're, they're actually a sizable group, okay? So we'll come back to that. Other organizations are things like Solar Education Outreach. Um, they do the trip to, to Haiti. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, there's also ESW, Engineers for Sustainable um, World. Um, there's D Design Build Institute of America in, in uh, the Knowlton School, and as is the uh, Servitecture. Okay? And then there's the Ecological Society of America, uh, America at Ohio State, which is in uh, Food Ag and Biological Engineering. Okay? So, seven student organizations. Nobody knows how big any of them are because nobody has a criteria for membership. Okay? But my sense is, is that ECOS and EWB are the big ones. From what I see, like, at ECOS meetings, you know, it's not unusual to go to an ECOS meeting and find 50 people there. Um, at the EWB talk that I gave, there was probably 50 people in the room. Okay? Whereas I know SEO and ESW are a smaller, more um, focused, perhaps. Okay? Um, okay, so that, that pretty much covers the programmatic pieces of um, the, the center. You have to understand, in, this, in the college there's a number of centers. Um, these are for concentrated activities um, in various areas, okay? So you can go look at the college website and look at all the other centers. So this is just one among several in the college, um, but with a, a different focus, okay? It's very interdisciplinary. I, I mean, uh, every discipline gets involved. I'm working with people across the spectrum in terms of, of discipline, which is really a, a, a lot, a lot of fun. Okay, so let's talk about um, where projects are done from the center. Um, I want to just sort of start in that upper left-hand corner. Um, David, are you here? No. Uh, that's El Salvador's flag, um, uh, and uh, projects were done um, for several years, three years, uh, I was told. Um, David, I believe, was on two of those from our class, David DeCole, um, and uh, Dr. Bixler um, went with the group. And they did a number of uh, projects then, but that has been discontinued. Um, that was associated with EWB, actually, okay? Next, um, Haiti. So what's going on in Haiti is the Solar Education Outreach Group under uh, the supervision of uh, uh, Roger Zwanza, okay, um, he takes them to Haiti and uh, they do solar things, put in solar panels. I heard them give a talk just last week on their final presentation and uh, <coughs> they put in solar panels on a kid's school um, in rural Haiti. Well, they've done, they've been doing this a number of years. They started out, the student group started out doing it on their own with nobody involved but just the students. And then Roger started going with them. He's gone, I think, two years now. Okay, um, so they're um, going sp spring break. Okay, so they went over spring break on um, the 15th. Okay, um, next, um, the Dominican Republic. There's a project being run out of EWB. Um, I'm told they're, they're taking seven um, students. They cap. That's what there's a rules from national. They cap it off, so there's seven students that are going. They're doing a civil engineering project. Um, uh, they're working on a bridge, okay? And uh, really an ambitious project. I mean, they've got a lot going, okay? Uh, working with the Dominican Republic. This will be a multi-year project from what I've been told. Um, their travel time, if I remember correctly, is early January, okay? So there's travel time for all these trips are all over the board. So while Haiti spring break, this is early January. In other words, you go like maybe Jan 1 and get back before class starts type idea. Okay, um, um, next one, Guatemala. You notice these Central American countries coordinated their flag colors in the blue, the light blue. 
Uh, the Guatemala Project is, is happening this summer. Um, if you want to learn more about it, you can ask uh, Aaron and Courtney are in here. They're going. Um, Aaron went with me last summer to set, uh, and several other students, Randall Berkeley and Sydney Anderson and Mary Share, to assess the site. Uh, a number of projects are going on from um, STEM education to uh, um, comparative analysis for technologies, just like the homework problem you're doing. We're doing that for cook stoves, water filtration systems, and solar lanterns. Okay? Um, so that's in Panahat Chow, Guatemala, by Lake, Lake Atipa. Next one, Honduras is where most of our activity over time has been. The Montana de Luz project, that's a rural area. As it sounds like, it's a little mountain. It's a little hill, really, uh, out, in, out in rural um, Honduras, out um, east of Tegucigalpa. <coughs> okay? uh, so that started in 05. It's been running since then. Uh, Dr. Merrill, John Merrill, um, and I had assessed the site in 04. And um, we took the first student group in 05 with Roger Zalanzak also. Uh, and then um, I got busy with other stuff. John and Roger took it over for many years. Um, and lately, um, it's shifted. Various people are involved. Uh, Edgar Casale has been doing a lot. John Schrock. And he saw one this past spring break, too. This has always been a spring break trip. Okay. Uh, it's a fantastic site. I would really encourage you to go. If you want more information, ask Isa as an example. But I think the best part of the trip is the kids. <laughs> I mean, technology is cool, but kids are better. I mean, the kids are wonderful. Um, and uh, they're used to having visitors. They're very open. Um, it's, it's really a nice thing. All the children have HIV AIDS or they won't, aren't let in. Okay. That's the criteria for entry. Um, next, there's two Cholo Teca trips. Uh, one of them's by um, How Dr. Howard Green or Howard Green. Um, I think Alex went when it was an aquaponics project. What year did you go? Uh, that was 2013. 2013. Okay, so recently he's this is this is a May term trip now. Okay, but um, he switched it. It's now this year starting its sustainable housing. So they're going down to build a house. I'm taking a, a group of students and. We'll be going, um, well, it's not that long from now, they're going down. Okay, um, that's the Chola Teca. Um, and then uh, Roger Zwanzak's projects uh, there, he, he's, he kind of branched off from Montana de Luz and started, I think it was four or five years ago, working with Chola Teca. They have done a huge variety of things, <laughs> everything from a bicycle powered electricity generator to a uh, a wind turbine to a wheelchair design for disabled person. I went to their project descriptions yesterday and they're doing like a, a cooling uh, method for somebody um, who has diabetes to store their insulin in um, and uh, when they don't have electricity and they don't have a refrigerator, okay? Um, uh, and there's variety, I mean, there's, you have to go to the website. There's been all kinds of different projects with um, Rogers uh, Choloteca um, project. This this trip um, um, for Choloteca with Roger is in uh, May Mester also in the May term. Okay, the trips in the May term have a nice flexibility in terms of time. Often the May term trips are a little bit longer. They're like two weeks, fourteen days, whereas it's nine or ten days on spring break, depending on where you're traveling to. Okay, um, so. The, some students like the spring break trips, some like the May masters, some like, everybody likes something different. January, whatever. Okay, uh, next one, this is Colombia. And that just uh, happened, uh, uh, the only students I, I, I've been going to Colombia since 1997, but um, uh, I never took students besides my Colombian PhD students. And we would go, and we did some service work. Actually, we put a, a computer lab in an orphanage in Medellin. Um, made some computer donations to an orphanage in Cali, um, and did a lot of education stuff. But uh, Professor Anderson and I got together, Betty Lisa Anderson, and uh, started to try to expand the program and take students. Just about a year and a half ago, we started that. So she, she focuses K through 12 more. I focused more university. It was a natural partnership. We did a lot of similar philosophy and things, low cost labs, STEM education. So we took a group um, over spring break this year and had, uh, um, let's see, 
had 11 students we talked. Um, we were in Bogota teaching to teachers and students, and we were in Pasto. Pasto is down by the Ecuadorian border. Um, we were teaching um, some universities, some students, but mostly K through 12 kids, okay? Our website will get updated. There'll be a lot more information um, on that. Of course, in the good old USA, we have things going on. I already explained some of that. The community technology clinic, for instance, with the homeless and so forth. Also with um, service providers, things like doing IT. If you want to do IT volunteer work, let me know because you can do IT volunteer work from almost anywhere in the world, right? I mean, it's it's a can be a great volunteer project. Um, Next, South Africa, Professor Katrina Cornish from um, FAPE, Food Agriculture and Biological Engineering. She runs a different program. She's not taking students to South Africa, but she's from South Africa. And she um, has a research program going on with the university there. And she gets her master's and PhD students involved to try to solve problems there. They're doing agricultural problems to try to grow plants that you can turn into rubber to, for instance, make gloves, okay? Um, at Ghana. So Ghana program's going on, been going on for about five years out of Milton School of Architecture with uh, Joe Campbell and Kim Burton. Uh, and last year it didn't run. There were, they couldn't get enough students to sign up because of the Ebola thing, okay? Now, there was no problem with Ebola where they're going, okay? But, you know, parents were like, Africa, Ebola, no way. So it didn't happen. It'll come up, though, and happen again um, in the coming year. Also, Roger Zwanzak just started, is started up a program with Ghana also. So get this. Um, Roger has three projects going. Ghana, okay, Honduras, and Haiti. He's doing three a year. He's very busy with this stuff. He's very good at what he does. He's been doing this stuff for a long time. Okay, I think his start date was 1979, like when I graduated from high school. Okay. So he's very experienced engineer, practical, get things done kind of guy. So he, I think he's fantastic. Would be, well, I've worked with him, so I know he's fantastic to work with. The only challenge of working with Roger is to keep it up with him. I mean, he is a hard worker. Okay. So the long trip's <laughs> happening. Next one's Tanz Tanzania. Tanzania is a startup. Um, uh, Dr. Hagenberger out of uh, civil engineering, new professor over there, is, is running that. Uh, there's been some uncertainty. I talked to him like a week and a half ago. And there's a little bit of uncertainty about exactly when they were going or what they were doing, but he has arranged, I believe, 10 students. I think you're going, right? Uh, probably. Yeah, okay. So, so there's uh, this activity, uh, it's not clear what's being focused on, but there's a, a large push in the university to work with Tanzania outside of the humanitarian engineering program. For instance, with the Global Water Initiative, okay, that Marty Kress um, is running. Now, there's another program, the India program, that's been going on a couple of years. They've been going to India, but they haven't done engineering work. But it's transforming now into, a, a, towards an engineering program. They're planning, they're, going to be working with Jai Per Foot. Has anybody heard of them? It's a very popular international organization. They make prosthetics. Feet. Okay. And uh, there's apparently a number of engineering problems with the manufacturing of the prosthetics. And apparently they're going to um, uh, try to get going on that. Uh, the people there are a new um, professor in EIC, Cheryl Sorby, Dr. Sorby, and then Dr. Abrams, Lisa Abrams, uh, has been involved with this for some time. And I think, um, I think some others too. Um, so, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, outside the U.S., one in the U.S., just here. And so, this is a big program. <coughs> now, how many people are going on each of those trips on average is probably 10. So, we're, we're spending almost, almost 100 people abroad, about 100 people abroad per year, okay? The interesting statistic on that, though, is if you go to the Honduras case, since 2000, so we're growing, okay? So since 2005, we've kept data on everything. There's about 198 travelers, uh, well that's before the last trip, so now it's over 200, um, to the three programs in Honduras, okay? Half of those have been women, of the travelers, which is, is 
the typical number you see for activity in humanitarian engineering is half. And of course, there's 20% women in the College of Engineering, so that half represents a significant over-representation of women. Okay? And you can all talk about why that might be the case. Okay, any questions about any of these programs? I tried to give you a brief overview, but I don't want this just me talking. I mean, are there questions about the programs? What, what I want to emphasize here is, is the info's at the website. Just Google Humanitarian Engineering Center. And you know, there's, there's um, you can click on the email addresses on everybody who's leading a various trip if you're interested, just email them. I mean, there's a huge range of projects here. I mean, the, the, I can't imagine some trip not fitting your interest because there's, they're all, uh, um, there's so much diversity here. You know, whether it's mechanical, civil, electrical, biomedical, whatever, engineering, you're, it's going to fit. So you're going to find a fit. I, I would undoubtedly say you would. Okay, so this is a pretty unique opportunity here. Uh, I don't, from assessing other sites, I think this is one of the largest in the country, if not the world, um, of activities on something like this. Um, so I really encourage you to use um, these opportunities. I think they're really nice. Um, okay, next. I want to talk a little bit about this, partners and sponsors. I know this is a mess, but let me dissect it. So we have all engineering disciplines involved, College of Social Works involved, uh, international development, some various people in either economics or uh, development studies, people from health and education. Uh, for instance, with uh, Professor Anders and I, we have um, Leslie Moore and uh, Melissa Wilson, professors in the College of Education and Human Ecology, involved in our project. Uh, College of Business, uh, Professor Tansky uh, is involved. The Global Water Initiative, Marty Kress started up, is, is running. Uh, the One Health Initiative is run by Professor Gabrace, who will be our expert evaluator, one of our expert evaluators on um, the finals day next Friday. Okay. And then uh, uh, in, in ag, there's a number of people. Uh, then there's NGOs and universities. So I just went and grabbed all the logos. I mean, there's universities. This is the University of Ghana. Uh, the one up in the right corner is uh, from Haiti. This is South Africa. Colombia, Colombia, and then a few from the U.S., Penn State, Purdue, and Colorado School of Mines. Then some uh, NGOs, um, so you've got um, World Gospel Mission and Children Take a Honduras, run by the Overholtz, um, uh, Larry and Angie. Um, these OSU alums, you know, they love the Buckeyes, so they're very helpful with the trips that go to Children Take a, in, in all possible ways. And then there's Mayan Families for the Guatemala trip, and of course, Montani de Luz. Uh, this over here is some of the people that um, have given us either right now or giving us financial support or have in the past. Um, I guess none of that's probably a surprise. Um, this is the local thing I talked about, the Community Technology Clinic. Work, basically think about it, working with the homeless or working with places, this is where they the food pantry, working with uh, the, the uh, service providers, with IT stuff for the service providers. Um, so there's quite a bit of activity there and it's growing actually right now, especially this summer. And then engineering field work, so I grabbed a bunch of photos from over the years. Um, my only challenge there was not finding enough photos or good photos, it was finding photos without the O-H-I-O -O in it, because it's like every photo is that. Um, so I only put one in. But look, here, you know, this is Andre and Montani de Luz this on the first trip. Roger Zwanzak, wheelchair, Cholateca, wind farm, wind uh, turbine, Cholateca, uh, car program with Jeff, uh, Joe Campbell. This is Eric Reynolds. He's at MIT D Lab right now. He's was past Eco's president, ME student. He gave a talk last year. He was the outside expert evaluator last year for this class for the final exam. Uh, this is him with the group. Um, they went to uh, this is uh, uh, basically Maya Pedal or you know, mine pedaling. Um, so this is a, this guy has a bicycle um, contraption shop. They do everything from making washing machines and chargers and blenders, everything you can think of. It's pretty amazing. Okay, I, I put a link in my book to that, 
to that. This is Katrina Cornerstone in South Africa. This is Montani Luce. This is the first Montani de Luce trip. Um, you see everybody there but me because I'm taking the photo. But there's Dr. Merrill over there, Swan Zach, etc. And uh, interestingly enough, at Ecos, there have been four marriages, two of them from, uh, from that original trip, actually. Um, up at the top, Choleteca with bicycle electricity generation. I think, Alex, you've seen this, you helped with this. This is the um, part of the aquaponics project, right? Down in the uh, Siete de Mayo, next to um, Choleteca. This is solar education outreach, as you would guess, down in uh, Haiti. You get the idea, okay? So it's, it's all over. And then you know what, you know what they're doing? That list right there is what they're doing. That's the stuff we've been talking about in class all semester, okay? So no, no surprises. Um, okay, questions before I go on, because that's, that's it with the center. I want to talk about how you run one of these projects, trips, okay? What you do and don't do and things like that. Um, <clears throat> So, local or international, these trips are not easy to operate and get right. Um, but there's two governing principles. Number one, do what's best for the community. <clears throat> now, that might seem like, well, duh, of course. Yeah, but usually when you're making um, decisions about how to do things and running the trip, who to involve, where to stay, whatever, usually it impacts this issue. Um, usually you always succeed if you say, okay, what's best for the community? Okay, this is. And you can make a decision. Uh, and of course, do no harm. That's not a simple matter there. Um, and uh, I, I, I may, it might seem like a funny thing to say, but you know, if you screw up on a project, you might say, well, so what? You know, they didn't have it anyway. But that, that's really not good because that's not, that's not true. Because you go down there and build up hope we implement this project, it's supposedly going to work, and it fails, we, what are they, what's lost? Hope. That's really important, the hope of the people. Okay, so you don't want to screw up. So in a certain sense, you do harm via a project failure. Now for universities, this gets a lot more complicated, actually, because you basically are trying, you want students to be learning, right, and yet you want the community to benefit. And the question is, do you trade one off against the other? In some cases, is it more all about the community and not about the students? Or in other cases, is it all about the students and not about the community? For instance, if you go to a project and there's, it's an engineering project, but there's no engineering content, you're just digging ditches or something that has nothing to do with engineering, well, then the students, in a sense, are suffering, besides the hot weather and the hard work. I, I mean, they, they're not learning anything. That's not good. But on the other hand, if, if someone goes down there and is doing nothing but a high-tech project, you haven't assessed needs, the community doesn't want it, then it, it start, it, then the community gets nothing. Now, if you achieve neither, then what you call it, what you call it is poverty tourism. That's an extremely negative term, okay? But it is a reality that does go on, okay? Of course, there's potential for harm by novices. I always feel like a novice. I mean, you know, you can't, it's, you can't know everything. You're always trying to learn. You gotta sort of take a humble attitude. But you gotta be careful because it's not a learning test <coughs> where you're not concerned about failure. You can't, you know, in a class, in the grand scheme of things, does it matter if you get a C or C plus, or a C or a B, or even a C or an A? Eh, probably not. Down there, it matters. You can't screw up. I mean, it matters a lot more because you're going to at least destroy hope, destroy relationships, okay, the people side, or you're just going to do other things like pollute your technology with your technology. A really big problem. The other thing I think is an important question to ask. This one I think is a crucial question. In fact, is who is helping whom? Okay, who is helping whom? Now this course is you know like the book is titled. Creating technologies that help people. Okay, so the whole focus is that. <coughs> That's really kind of inaccurate. Because I don't know, several of you have taken these kind of trips and done these kind of things. Whenever I come back, I always sort of do a balance sheet in my head. And what did they get, what did I get? 
I might seem might seem crass, but I, I I'm not sure I've ever walked away and felt like I've given more than I've gotten. I mean, because I learned a huge amount. I might have helped, sure. Okay, but what did I get? Okay, I think there's nothing wrong with admitting that that people are helping you. So in the past, what help have I got? I've been taught how to dance in Colombia more than once. They should just give up because it's hopeless with me. Um, I've been taught, I think, a better attitude about time in Latin America, not just Colombia, but Guatemala, El Salvador, Mexico, Honduras. Trust me, I think it's manana is a better attitude about time. Okay? So I've gotten a lot of help. If I give it more, I don't know the answer to that. But I think it's, it's, it's an honest thing to ask that question. It's a great thing to sit around the fire at night and, you know, or whatever and, and ask that question. Who's getting help here? And just see what people say. Because they think there's a lot of help going on. And I've talked about students with, this, with students in private about this over the years. And I'm, I'm talking with confidence here. When I say, I've seen some students that they're getting a lot more help than they're giving. And they're working hard for the people and with the people. Okay? But they're getting a lot, a lot out of this. Okay? And a lot of people that do this say it's transformative. That's a gift to you, right? And that is. It's a real gift. Okay, next. Usually what happens with these sites, you don't just go with a group. What happens is somebody goes and checks out the place and picks the site before you go. So usually that involves um, you know, an assessment um, of the whole site and situation. Well, probably the most crucial, if you were to say what's the most important thing about a project site, it's the partner, a person, one person lives there on the ground that'll work with you, help you with logistics, etc., help you understand the community, etc. A lot of the OSU programs are connected to alumni. It's amazing. They're very dedicated to Ohio State and they help a lot. They're crucial. Our whole program is happening on the back of the relationships like that. All, all of our programs are happening on the backs of those relationships. That's why when you talk to people you know, running these programs, they'll, they'll emphasize that. The relationship with these people, what it's all about. And if, you, if a student or anybody else screw, starts screwing up that relationship, people get pissed because it matters. It, it matters for the long-term um, success of the program. The relationship is what matters. Person-to-person -person relationship. And remember early in the book, Holman said it. Everything happens on the back of a relationship. Everything. And that seems weird in a certain sense, but it's true. It's really, really true. So the partner is crucial. And then probably, um, you know, the security issue and health issue are really important. The security issues is a tough one because, you know, Honduras has the number one murder rate in the world, for, for instance. Um, of course, a lot of that's around San Pedro Sula, but nonetheless, it is. It, it, it's the case. They have a U.S. Department of State travel warning. Uh, other countries we're talking about here have a state, Department of State travel warnings. Other ones deserve to have it. So there's, there's significant concern, security concerns, and you can't understand those from a distance. You need people that live there, know what they're doing, they know where to take you, where not to take you. Think about it for a minute. If you had somebody visiting you, visiting Central Ohio, and they say they want to visit X place, you would say, ah, uh, X isn't so good. You shouldn't go there, right? In Columbus, Ohio, we all know where we're talking about. You know where to go and where not to go. The locals know that. You can't know that from a distance. You could not know that. You can research it, you can get advice, but really understanding it, you need locals. Uh, and you stick with the locals. Why? They know where they're going, they know what they're doing. They don't want to get hurt, right? So if you stick with them, you're not going to get hurt, right? I mean, that's a really important idea. Health. Uh, the health issue is connected things. Um, first of all, like OSU has insurance. Uh, everybody that's going on these trips has to be on insurance. And if there's a major medical problem, you either take in a local clinic um, or your life flighted out. Okay. Um, but usually what's happening is not that, but the problem with food and water, um, a lot of places, in particular water, uh, is a difficult one. 
Um, it is, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to get used to not being, not being able to have any water. That means, you know, things even like the salad that you're eating, um, the juice drink, it's made out of water, uh, other food that's prepared with water. Um, you know, it goes on and on, it's like, um, so what you usually do is you do the smart thing, you try to, you take a modium. Modium's your buddy, man, you take it with you. Okay, over to come. You try to get your doctor to subscribe, prescribe ciprofloxin, cipro, okay? And the first time you hit that diarrhea, the first thing you do is take an Imodium immediately, okay? Why not? And if it doesn't stop, take another one, <laughs> you know, pretty quick. And then, then if it's looking like it's gonna be a real problem, boom, take the Cipro and follow the doctor's orders. I mean, you gotta do that, you gotta take it seriously because it's not just about diarrhea, okay? Um, I don't know if you've ever had this. Has anybody had this? Okay, so I've had it several times. Uh, it is not as simple as diarrhea. It can put you on. It, it can put you in bed. It can. It can lay you out. It's serious. Okay. So you got to be really careful. Depends what. Yeah. Next, housing. You want to be in a safe area. Transportation. Safe transportation. Um, a lot of times you wouldn't be taking a, just an arbitrary taxi, for instance. You you would have transportation of some other sort. Then, of course, on a project site, you want good engineering problems. Yes? Uh, question about the water for these trips. Why isn't every kind of participant, like from the university, like every student or whatever, uh, kind of equipped with just the handheld water filtration system and chlorine tablets? I mean, that, that you could do that. Um, solves every it, single water problem that you have for, for, on a personal level. That could be done. Uh, it depends on each case. In some cases, that probably um, uh, is cumbersome. Uh, what happens in some trips, um, there's uh, an ability to buy um, water easily, pure water in a bottle, and you just stick with that. Um, and you brush your teeth with it, you, you know, you, okay, so, and you carry it through the day and drink and so forth. Um, but yes, you could do some rock like that. Um, I've done that before, actually, myself. Not with student groups, but in my own travels. So, I mean, you could go like an MSR, like, oh, yeah. for it's like this big, so. Yeah, you can get a little hand thing that's about this long, it's carbon-based, and they're, they're really effective, you're right. Um, so that, that's another option, certainly. Okay, so good engineering problems, um, and uh, you know, however that's defined, um, you might want those problems to match your envision group that's going to be going there. But that's hard to do. And you want it to be that the people sort of welcome you to come. You don't want to just show up, hey, we're here to help. I mean, you've got to have a sense that this is welcome, okay? Um, questions, comments? So preparation, the way we do it at Ohio State, we have classes like service learning, capstone design. Uh, typically, these involve uh, learning about um, engineering, technology, and culture. Those are the, for the particular country, and particular problems like appropriate technology development, um, and then usually reflection goes on. And there's a number of possibilities. Some people like the nightly journal, okay. Some people like the real touchy feely talky sessions. Um, some some of our faculty or staff that run these programs do not like that at all. <laughs> They're engineers, you don't get touchy-feely on us, okay? Uh, group discussions of all sorts, this could be over dinner, this could be at night, whatever. Uh, trip report is, essential, is pretty much essential um, with group inputs, photos. Nice, somebody, if, if someone can bring a tablet or a laptop and put this in and have it done before you land, because they're very hard to get done after you land. Um, and then presentation, often when you come back, sometimes before you go, to the Humanitarian Engineering Center group. I mean, people are invited and, and hear about uh, projects. That's happening all the time. The issue of accountability, okay? Remember William Easterly raised the issue of accountability? He said, you know, what does an aid organization care if it succeeds? I mean, they, they don't lose anything. The whole project screws up. They don't lose anything, they just walk away. So I think it's a, in the university, we have an opportunity to have accountability. And the way we do accountability, of course, in universities with grades. So a lot of this is great, okay, that we do in all these tracks. Uh, the question is, is how? Well, I think you need to establish and publish a rubric. Or, or, or you need to say what you're evaluating, how you're evaluating, and it's gotta be clear to everybody involved, okay? 
Um, so the question is, is, will this create more concern about doing a good job in the community? Uh, I think for some students, it absolutely does not matter. <laughs> Actually, the majority of students I've worked with in these kind of things, the grade's irrelevant. They're going to do a great job no matter what. It's like the grade just comes. And, but there's usually a couple students where this matters. Uh, you know, you hang the grade over them, they care about their grade point, then they'll do it right. Now, of course, there's a type of student who cares about neither. They don't care about grades, and they're kind of along for a trip, just checking it out. That's pretty rare, though. I, I don't want to, it's not even fun to discuss. I mean, there, there are cases like that, okay, where it's, someone's not very effective on a trip. That's just the reality, okay? They may be, oh, you never know what's going on. Sometimes I've seen a language issue, very hesitant to engage because they don't know the language. And, and I, I think that's a very bad thing. I mean, you can get along with people without knowing language. You can do an awful lot, right? Shake their hand and smile, you know? I mean, you can do a lot, especially if you're working. Think about it. If you're working together, you can do an awful lot together with no words whatsoever, okay? Um, so jump in and help. Uh, so there's all kinds of different ways to think about this accountability problem because in my view, the right way, which I'm not sure is possible, is not for, for instance, me to grade. I want to let the people grade the students, right? But they're the ones that are getting the benefit. How did, good did they do at giving benefit to the whatever they were doing? Let them grind, okay? But that, that's a little tough, and you're, you're, you're asking them to do something it may not be possible. Uh, you might get an NGO to do it for you, though. Um, say, can you tell us what you're, you may not get them to assign a number, but you, you might be able to have them say, yeah, this person did good, this person didn't talk to us all, I don't even know who that, what was their name? You know, so, so sometimes you can get feedback, but sometimes that could be rather difficult. Okay. Uh, if you're you on a trip and there's no accountability, no grading, I think you should bring it up with the leader. Yes. I think it'd be important not to focus too much on results either. Um, you know, you can grade based on what their plan was going in, how well they prepared, how well they dealt with difficulties. I mean, it might be, say if the mayor came in of the village and said, scrap all this, are you going to punish the student yep. for that? No. You have to uh, you're right. This is not easy to grade because it has to be very flexible because you're right. What happens on the ground is like all of a sudden this changes, and the this, this student who was going to do this has spent six months to a year getting ready to do something. Can't do it. It was a waste for them to be there because, yeah, the mayor walked in or some scheduling problem. Or when you're in Pasto, Colombia, they had a strike for a full day and we couldn't do anything that day. Okay? I mean, and that did screw us up on some stuff. This, you're right, stuff happens. So it's gotta be kind of fluid and flexible. It, 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 is, it is quite difficult, actually. But I think the principle should be that you establish an agreement of some sort. Because once you do that, then it creates a more serious tone. And it should evoke professionalism. It should, yes? Is there any kind of accountability at a higher level so that like EWB assesses Ohio State's group and says, you guys are doing a good job or not a good job, and here's how you need to fix it. That's a complicated issue. Um, we should probably go offline with that one. Um, I've heard various stories from professors that advise EWB, and there is a higher level oversight. Um, whether that's effective or not is the question. On other programs that we're talking about, if there's a project failure, there's no oversight. There's no oversight. The people that, that suffer from a project failure are the locals uh, and uh, the NGO or partner. And it creates a lot of bad will, stuff like that. So, um, no, there's nobody, nobody says you can help. I mean, yeah, there's no, there's no one level up overseeing the whole thing. Um, I will tell you though, there's a lot of sharing of information amongst, you know, all the flags, the people that are doing it, a lot of sharing of information between us and trying to try to get this right. I mean, people are really serious about trying to get this right. And we learn from each other all the time. I mean, 
and it's improved. We've learned a lot over the years. It's improved a lot. Plus, you read about failures of other groups, okay, and other problems. So, you you can uh, get onto this how to do this the right way. But I can tell you that there's so many complexities. I mean, just I've been trying hard to get it all in my book. And it's hard. It's hard for me to, I'll, I'll be like on the trip in Colombia and I'll real. I'll be like, oh, I forgot about this because I just saw something. Type it in, type it in, type it in. It's, it's, so yeah, it's difficult. Any other comments? Um, practical issues. Okay, we talked about security. We talked about health. But I want to tell you something about security. You got to be careful with security. Go read, pick Honduras. Go to U.S. Department of State Travel Warnings Honduras. Just Google that and read it. I promise you, you're going to be like, I'm not going there. <laughs> okay? But think about it carefully. Okay? When you read that, you got to think about it really carefully. Number one, we're talking about a pretty good-sized country. Uh, if you looked at a report like that on Ohio, how would it look? You know? It would look different. Not a question. But, you know, I've had European friends or colleagues or whatever who have looked at going to the U.S. and said, no way. All you people own guns and are shooting each other. <laughs> now, why would a European say that about us nice Americans? Well, they got good reasons to say it. No, I'm kidding. No, I mean, it, it, it's because of the news, right? Think of the tragedies we've had in the last number of years. Everything from Columbine to, you know, Sandy Hook or whatever. From a distance, we look nuts. We look absolutely nuts. So you gotta be careful with your interpretation of what this is. The locals matter, right? I mean, when I go to Colombia, it's like being with my sons. Why? Well, they're my PhD students, okay? They're not gonna let the old man get hurt. Okay, so it matters who's on the ground. And the Buckeyes that help run the program and children take it. They, they don't want any OSU students getting hurt. They're gonna be careful. So you, it matters that part of the thing, okay? So we talked about health, food, drink. Dress is a tricky issue. It depends on every country. Um, Americans generally are very laid back on what they wear. We're very, very informal compared to the rest of the world, um, in particular the developing world. And uh, we do um, what's considered really, um, we look promiscuous. That would be the, this word that people would use from other countries. You know, by showing skin, <laughs> wearing short pants. Okay, imagine that, wearing short pants. Um, so we, we, uh, we dress generally um, quite informal, and you cannot assume that you can wear what you wear here or there, period. Find out what to wear. Why? It's a security issue, first of all. I mean, because you're going to stand out like an American. You know, most of you will look like an American. Boom. I'll think you're an American. Bam. And they're going to think, what? They're rich. Therefore, you're a target. You speak English. Perception is you're rich. You're a target. Okay? But it's more than that. There's the gender issues. Okay? So, um, ladies, you know, the reality is, is that you, you in particular have to be careful, I think, at least the countries I've been in. You don't, you don't wear short pants. You don't show a lot of skin. You don't. You, you you don't wear a lot of jewelry. You don't. You know. You just. You just don't do that stuff. I mean, that's bad practice. Okay. Sorry, but that's the reality. Um, and uh, I know it's different in every country, so it's hard to discuss this for particular cases. I'm talking about countries. You know, I typically go to, and you know, it's just sort of. Understand, and, and in some sense, it can in some times in some locations in a country, it can be kind of okay. Of course, if you're on a beach, it's okay. Jogging, it's probably okay. But the, the question is, is if you were in a, a crowd in this country you're going to, in a city, and you looked at crowd, well, what would you see? How many people are dressed in short pants with a baseball cap like this? One American, okay. You see what I'm saying? I mean, it, it, there's, there's that. Um, you don't, women, you don't need to draw your unnecessary, unwanted attention to yourself. I mean, period. I mean, I, you know, I hope no one has a problem with this, but this is just what I've found in talk, talking to people from other countries and having gone there. So, um, flexibility. 
don't think that everything's going to go according to schedule and everything's going to happen. Be flexible. Um, communications amongst the group and with people is very important. Being prompt. Uh, it's hard keeping everybody together. Um, the number one problem for um, in terms of injuries and things like that for OSU study abroad, which is a lot of people every year, is traffic problems. Okay. Uh, in other countries, they don't respect the, you know, the, the, the so-called zebra, you know, the striped lines going across the street. In America, you just walk, and the car stops, right? Forget it. It's not going to happen in a lot of other countries. They're just going to run you down. Okay, so it's a tough issue, but it's the, it, you would think that that is the law because it's international or something, but it's not. There's different traditions. There's all kinds of things like that. Uh, money is a complicated issue because you're usually trans, uh, you know, you're, you're changing money. Um, it seems that it's different uh, how to do it the best way, either via your bank here, a bank in the airport in the U.S. on the way there, a bank in the country you're going to, or no, a, 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 a cash changing place in the country you're going to, a bank in the country you're going to, an ATM in the country you're going to. What's got the best of two things? The conversion rate or the charge to do the transactions in the first place. How do you find the best rate? Good luck. <laughs> you have to do a lot of research, okay? Um, there's also safety issues there. You probably don't want to use the ATM in country because if it's out in the street at the wrong time, it's problematic, okay? And you don't think you can just walk in the bank there either. I have been in a country where you walk to several walk in, say, I'd like to change some money, and then, senor, it's out there. Go use the ATM. They won't do it in the back. Okay? So it's not necessarily like here. And you have an open, compromising, at, a comp be really to compromise on things with other people, have a good, positive, open, humble attitude, and of course, be a professional um, engineer. Uh, somebody told me this long ago. I think it really is applicable. Um, when it comes to these issues, this is, these are complicated issues. You get on the ground in these places. It's a complicated situation, especially with respect to security. You know, it's a very new environment for you. It's every, you're, you're just inundated with the whole, everything is different, okay? Uh, but that last statement really holds in the end. I mean, it might seem like a mess to you just because it's different, you know? It's, that's what I mean by the word mess. I mean, um, there's many ways to interpret that, that word, I think. And, you know, these are just broad guidelines. Every country is going to have, you know, different, different issues. Okay. Um,